Meeting the Insurance and Labor Committee to order. Thank everybody for being here on this call meeting at an early hour, and I'm sure we're going to have some other members to to drift in. So, uh, Chairman Robertson, would you give us a word, please? If you'll bow your heads with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beautiful day you've given us today, Lord God. Let us not waste it, God, on pettiness and, and, and anger. Let us focus on the compassion that you bless each and every one of us with as we lead this state to where we feel it needs to be. Uh, bless this committee. Help uh, our minds be clear and wise. We ask these things in your precious name, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Thank you. All right, we're going to get started first on uh, Chairman Kirkpatrick's uh, bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, let me do a little introduction. Let me, let me interrupt. I was just trying to find my paperwork here. I got things stacked up. Um, Senate Bill 80 is uh, is a uh, what we're calling a prior authorization bill, and it was uh, sent to subcommittee. Uh, Chairman Watson uh, had a, a committee, a, meet, a subcommittee meeting on it, and heard uh, a good bit of testimony. Uh, there's been, I'm, I'm going to conservatively say, uh, many iterations of the bill. Uh, the, the chair lady has made many uh, alterations and uh, changes at the suggestion of industry as well as. Uh, input from the Department of Community Health, which obviously is a, a, a big uh, provider of uh, coverage for members of our state. Uh, so my, my plan today is not to hear uh, but limited public testimony. I want the author of the bill to go over the latest version with the changes, uh, of course, a little summary of intent for those that weren't on the subcommittee, and uh, we'll plan on trying to uh, move this bill forward uh, today. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, before I get into the details of this bill, let me just tell you the latest LC number, which came in late last night, and there are a few changes that uh, I would like to make at when we finish going through the bill. It's LC 460435S. Is that what you have? Okay. Um, so this bill is a, regards prior authorization, and it's a bipartisan consumer protection bill that attempts to handle an issue that I hear about on a regular basis from patients and doctors. Prior authorization, as most of you know, is a process that requires approvable, approval for medical treatments, procedures, diagnostic tests, and drugs. This process has become a bigger problem over the last few years, and most medical offices and hospitals send as much staff time navigating this process as they do providing medical care. The bill doesn't argue whether prior authorization is a good idea or not, saves anyone money, or helps or hinders medical care. It simply attempts to establish some rules of the game for the process. It does not get into the policies of private and government payers as to what they approve or don't approve. This is about transparency and making sure that everybody knows the rules. I've met with many stakeholders on both sides of this issue, including not only the providers struggling to get treatment approved for their patients, but the insurers, private and public, as well as the agencies involved in the process. And I've gotten a lot of useful feedback from both sides, and I've incorporated many suggestions into the substitute bill and will continue to work on it as the bill moves forward. I especially want to thank the Department of Community Health and the Office of the Commissioner of Insurance for helping throughout the process. Um, just to go through the bill, and I'm going to try to be very high level on this and answer specific questions if y'all have any, but it is a 21-page uh, bill, and so uh, I'm not going to get too much in the weeds. We covered most of it in subcommittee in detail. This bill adds uh, to existing law in Title 46. And we already have law that is uh, regulated by the insurance commissioner. And this just adds, uh, in Article 1, pages 1 through 9, just adds definitions, um, which most of which are already in the law. And I don't think there's anything earth-shattering there. Article 2 is where the meat of the bill takes place, starting on page 15. And this um, requires that criteria 
for prior authorization to be posted on websites available to healthcare providers. And it also provides for statistics on approvals and denials and um, related things. On page, uh, that's on page 15. On page 16, it outlines the qualifications for reviewers and for reviewers of appeals. And then that's on 16 and 17. On page 18, the timeline is defined. And I changed this to match the new federal CMS guidelines. And what that is is 72 hours for urgent um, issues and seven business, uh, sorry, seven calendar days for non-urgent issues. And it makes it clear that prior authorization is not required for emergencies or for emergency transportation. On page 19, there are criteria for honoring a prior authorization and requiring payment on, in most circumstances. And then on page 20, this is a little confusing. It honors the prior authorization when you're changing plans within an insurance company or when a private review entity, a utilization review entity is changed. But it does not bind a new insurance company because that's in our contract law and would not be uh, consistent with our Constitution. The um, effective date, I changed that to January of 2022. And it also says that uh, contracts, new contracts or renewals after that date would be impacted. And uh, the amendments that I was mentioning are, and uh, this substitute, we finished it late last night and a couple of things need to be fixed if you guys will humor me on that. On line 383. Before you start, let, okay. let me, she's uh, provided a little sheet of these amendments and they're mainly Scrivener's type things. They're not substantive, but, but if you wanna follow what she's doing, we gave everybody a copy. Okay. This is clean up. Um, Basically, on line 383, it adds an or at the end of the sentence. On line 385, it ends the sentence and then deletes the next section, 385, uh, sorry, 386 to 395, because that's already covered in the appeals section that's farther down in the bill. And then the only other changes I had intended on line 465, and we had discussed changing 60 days to 30 to match some of the existing contract language for how long prior approvals are honored. And uh, that change didn't make it into the sub, so I'd like to fix that at the same time. And so with that, Mr. Chairman, that I think covers the highlights of the bill, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, do any members have any questions? for the author. Yes, sir. All right, you're at number two. Go okay. ahead. I, I'm correct that, the, that for emergencies, those are waived. 72 hours, you said, is a, what, what is the criteria on the 72 hours? That's for urgent conditions, and that's defined in there, things that could cause permanent harm. Okay, to the that, patient if there's a delay in I treatment. Could see, I could see that being a challenged issue sometime because what you and I think is urgent or, or in that respect. Um, oh, is there a functional definition for urgent? Uh, uh, yes, it and okay. it's, it's in the bill. Okay. And okay. an example of that would be, uh, for example, someone seen in the emergency room, they get their hands stitched up, and I use hand surgery examples because that's what I know. Right. Um, and they're referred to a specialist and then they're found to have a tendon injury and it needs to be fixed within a certain period of time. It doesn't have to be today, but it needs to be less than a month, you know, gotcha. less actually around a week would be the outside right. for that. So that would just be an example of an urgent type of situation that would not be an emergency, but it's also not a standard elective procedure. Right. And, and that's already being utilized for years in, okay. the, in, the, okay. in the industry. Okay. Also, this would apply to uh, all insurance companies, HMOs as well, I'm assuming, are, are, are have the same criteria that they have to operate with, correct? Yes. Okay. And in fact, some of them already have contracts where the criteria is even tighter okay. than what's in the bill, which is totally fine. But um, right now, there are no real parameters in that area. So this just starts to establish some guidelines. Any opposition from the in industry as far as 
for, from that standpoint any feet are you getting any feedback just curious you know there there is opposition to this right. bill and uh, I've done my level best to meet with everyone that I thought had a dog in the fight and address their concerns some of it I've changed some of it I am not going to change right. but I have committed to continuing to work on changes that make sense as the bill moves right. forward in the process right. Th 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 and I thank you for working on it because I believe this is being in the industry and around the industry there's nothing more frustrating for a person when they have a medical condition and they th the doctor says we need to go here and the insurance company and you're caught between the devil and the blue sea deep blue sea so we need to do that and protect ultimately the client uh, the, the the customer or the client or citizen as far as that but thank you appreciate your work on it uh, anybody else Chairman Robertson um, <coughs> Chairman, on line 365, where you're asking that an insurer using prior authorization shall make statistics available regarding prior authorization approvals, uh, that process there is is that primarily for the um, for the consumer? No. Okay. That it it initially was the consumer and the covered person, but I took that out and left it to the healthcare providers because. A lot of the criteria are not going to be understandable anyway to right. a consumer, and really the healthcare providers just need to know what they're dealing with and what they're supposed to do, and so we limited that. I think that'll make it much easier to implement. And is there a way when a consumer goes to purchase insurance that they can find the information as to how friendly? The, the their their company would be on these PA type situations. In other words, if you know, I, I wouldn't think I would want to be with a company that is notorious for for pushing back on PAs. The um, the part about the statistics being Correct. available. That that yeah the, that was so the criteria would only be available to healthcare providers. Right. But the statistics would be available to anyone. Okay. That was yeah. That was my question. Thank you. And I think that's a good point, Chairman Robertson. I think that's one of the, the main points of this bill is just transparency, okay. you know, to know that you know what you're, what you're getting when you buy a product. That's right. Anybody else? I don't see anybody. We're going to take limited testimony because this bill has gone through a, a subcommittee. And, but before we do that, Chairman Watson, since you ran that meeting, you have any, anything to add or? Uh, no. I want to appreciate your work on it with Chairman Kirkpatrick. Everybody in the room to know that, that this has gone through multiple different uh, amendments and substitutions and changes, and uh, I think it's been exhaustive the way the, uh, the author has worked with, with all sides on this. And I, uh, the subcommittee, um, it was a hearing only, so we're here and uh, and ready to go. All right, thank you. Yeah, and, and again, the only reason I didn't have them vote on it because we knew it was going to change substantially, and I just felt like it was, what you voted on wasn't going to be the same thing we we voted on today. So, want any other reason? But uh, we'll hear limited testimony. Uh, Jesse Wellington's uh, first on the list. If y'all could let him in. Please uh, identify yourself just for the record. Uh, Jesse, thanks for being here today. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Jesse Wellington. I am uh, with you this morning on behalf of the Georgia Association of Health Plans, which is the commercial trade group representing Georgia's uh, health insurance benefits industry and the small group and individual market. Um, want to start off by expressing my gratitude to the bill sponsor. Um, she has worked with us diligently on m multiple versions of this bill. Uh, we will definitely take you up on your offer to continue working on it as it moves through the process. Uh, but as written, uh, our members uh, still have uh, serious concerns with Senate Bill 80, um, which would impact our ability to ensure that our plan beneficiaries have access to quality, affordable, affordable health care. Um, 
we have shared some detailed information around this with the subcommittee as well, so I won't re uh, belabor the point there, but just want to share with the committee that the prior authorization process is not applied indiscriminately to thwart medical care or get in between the doctor-patient relationship. Uh, these are targeted evidence-based measures that we employ for reasons um, that are manifold, including uh, quality uh, access, combating fraud, waste, and abuse, uh, and making sure that our patients receive timely, appropriate care. The vast majority of claims for drugs and services are not subject to prior approval. Of those, the vast majority are eventually approved uh, due to additional follow-up from an individual's health care provider and uh, the utilization review staff. Most prior authorizations are approved within 72 hours for urgent care and within two weeks for non-urgent care. Um, insurance companies are prohibited by federal law from using prior authorization for emergency services already and we must pay for those as, even if they're out of network. Um, the health plan is the only player in the ecosystem with a 360 degree view of the patient, uh, 360 degree view of the patient's overall care picture. Um, one of the reasons that we employ these processes again is to make sure that unnecessary or uneconomic uh, or low quality care is not delivered um, and to control things like uh, drug drug interactions, um, off-label prescriptions, and things of that nature. But um, again, don't want to get into the weeds on this bill. Look forward to continuing to work with the sponsor across the across the way over in the house, um, and appreciate the movement that you made thus far. All right, thank you. Anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Senator you Sims, thank you for being here. I was the first one here. I know. I mayor. I'm so sorry. Twice. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the first question is, how would this Senate Bill 80 negatively impact um, the clients? And you said eventually approval is given. What do you mean by eventually? It's so broad. How long does it take for approval to take place? So. Those two questions I wanted to ask. Sure, Senator, great question. Um, so for the first piece, uh, you know, one example in the bill is there is a uh, six-month duration for a PA that's approved for a chronic and long-term care condition. Um, currently, we're issuing prior authorizations that last anywhere from 72 hours up to three years, and so that just covers the gamut of anything that you can do to put in or on a human being. Um, and that just six months is sort of, you know, picking a number. It, should it be three months? Should it be longer? We really think it should be individually determined per patient based on their condition um, and the specific dis policies as it relates to that patient's disease state. Um, and then uh, additionally, your second question was, I'm sorry, ma'am. How would this bill negatively impact those individuals that are, have to ask to get permission for prior approval. Oh, and, and you also ask about timelines as well. Um, so we've provided the author with a comprehensive substitute that references national clinical accreditation standards. Similarly to how the state of Georgia licenses hospitals, you allow a third party national independent group to certify that they met all the requirements of state law. Um, the national accreditation bodies like URAC, NCQA have comprehensive timelines that mirror the language in the bill. So the 72 hours, 24 hours, um, two weeks turnaround time, we would just like those national standards incorporated via reference uh, rather than a more prescriptive approach as outlined in the bill. All right. I'm not, again, I don't want to spend a lot of time getting in the weeds in here since we had a subcommittee, but Chairman Watson, because you were so gracious to chair that subcommittee, I will give you all deference possible. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, just a couple of comments, not really questions. So the, the timeline that you prescribe is unlike, uh, I presume it's different or you wouldn't be bringing it up, but what the timeline we have in the bill actually relates to the federal regulations uh, that uh, I presume the time change was relating to, relating to that, and I get a nod from the author. Uh, so that's a comment that I don't think necessarily the insurance companies should be pointing to a different uh, time frame that's been thoroughly vetted before and is actually much more liberal than, than uh, what was originally proposed in the bill. So I, I would hope you would applaud us on that, number one. Number two is that to say the insurance company has a 360 degree view of the patient and you're the only ones, or the implication is that you're the only ones to have that is certainly a misrepresentation to, to that the physician or the primary care physician, or the health care provider should have that and do have that. So I, I know you didn't mean to offend, but a little bit maybe. Okay. 
Well, I certainly would not want to do anything to uh, disparage the relationship between the patient and the physician. I did not intend my remarks to be so um, so directed. My apologies, Chairman. All right. Thank you, Mr. Whittington. Appreciate you being here. Thank you all. And we'll continue to work with you. Next, Jeff Breedlove. And again, I'm being kind, and we've got members with meetings, and we've got another major bill to do, so I'm talking about 60 seconds. Yes, sir, just Mr. Chairman. Jeff Breedlove, um, person in long-term recovery, uh, Chief of Policy, Georgia Council on Substance Abuse, also privileged to represent over 30 citizens groups who have signed a bipartisan, uh, nonpartisan letter of support for this bill. We want to thank uh, Senator Kirkpatrick for her more than gracious leadership. Here's my quick message. At the end of all the words in all those pages, are people. They're taxpayers. They're people who are our families of Georgia. I appreciate the leadership of the, in, of the insurance industry. At some point, what we need to remind this committee and the members of the Senate is that when there's a conflict between the insurance industry and the people of Georgia, we need to side with the people of Georgia. At some point, we can only concede so much to them. We must put the people of Georgia first. Transparency is essential. They have a right to know these things. And I just want to end with the point also from uh, Chairman Watson. The notion that the insurance industry is the only entity that has the comprehensive view, I would suggest the patient has the best view. And at the end of the day, this is a relationship between the patient and their doctor. And the people of Georgia, I assure you, stand with this bill, with Senator Kirkpatrick, and with transparency. And there are many, many, many thousands watching and supporting this bill. Thank you for your comments. Mr. Power. See you outside. Thank you for being here. Introduce yourself, but kind of limit your comments to anything that uh, Mr. Witherington hadn't already said. If you don't yes, sir. Mind. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. Um, we thank uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick for bringing this important piece of legislation up for discussion, and we do thank uh, her for her willingness to work with with her on this bill. Um, unfortunately, oh, sorry, I should say Michael Power with the Pharmaceutical Care Management Association. I sorry, I just. In an intent to be brief, I just jumped right into it. Um, PCMA represents uh, a number of pharmacy benefit managers. Uh, our companies include like CVS Health, Caremark, Cigna, Express Scripts, companies like that. Uh, across the country, you have probably 270 million Americans uh, that receive benefits through a PBM. Um, so uh, we're here today respectfully in opposition of Senate Bill 80 in its current form. And we did provide uh, Senator or Dr. Kirkpatrick uh, a comprehensive list of, of, of concerns that we have with the bill. Um, an overarching theme that we are concerned with is, you know, medical and the pharmacy benefit are two very um, critical pieces of the healthcare world. And, and they are different to some degrees. And, and there are parts of this bill um, that include both of those in their definitions and how they're trying to apply in the marketplace. And really, uh, our recommendations to Dr. Kirkpatrick sort of help try to clarify some of those things and some issues that we thought may arise uh, if this legislation were to pass as written. So with that, uh, I'll conclude my comments. I appreciate your brevity, and thank you for being here. Thank you. All right. You're oh, okay. All right. I, don't, I don't see anybody uh, raising their hand for questions. Right. So. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, I'm at the point where I'm open for recommendations on this bill. What is the committee's, uh, and I'm on recognize Chairman Watson as subcommittee chair to have that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like to move uh, due pass uh, on this important piece of legislation, uh, SB 80, um, and we've already gone over the LC number, so I'll leave it at that. Okay, well, I, I want to, before we do that, I need to get those amendments approved, uh, uh, if you don't sorry. mind. Yes. Uh, so. so I'd like to make a motion, the amendments as listed by uh, Senator Kirkpatrick that are outlined in that uh, sheet of paper there uh, and that she went over. So uh, motion to amend uh, SB 80 as outlined. Okay. So we're going to vote on the amendment first. We got a second from yeah. Chairman Walker. We got a chair. chair. We're going to let... The lady who was here earliest have that second, <laughs> Chairman Walker. I'm sorry. Second. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, all right. Uh, all those in favor of the amendment, 
please raise your hand and keep them up. Okay, thank you, it's unanimous. All right, uh, and now we're going to vote on the bill uh, as a committee substitute. Good. I'd like to make a motion uh, do pass for a committee substitute for SB 80. Okay, second. I got a second from my old seatmate, Senator Sims. Working hard for the people, hard for the people every day. Okay, we have a motion and second. Any further discussion? All right, all those in favor of the motion on the committee substitute, raise your hand, please. All right, it's unanimous, okay. Uh, thank you all, and we will move on to our next bill. I appreciate everybody, and, and again, we're gonna continue to, to work on this bill, and uh, I, I, one comment I wanna make is you know, I think most of us perceive because of whether it's family members or ourselves that, that the, the prior authorization pendulum is a little bit to the, uh, too far to one side and, and we're, we're certainly not trying to uh, cause uh, harm to the, the businesses that are providing a, a great service with insurance coverage to Georgians, but we're trying to find a, a, a balance in the middle that, that is uh, a, a better place than I think we feel like it is today. So that's that's the, the whole goal there. So thank you all for your work on this. It's very important. All right, Chairman Harbin, you're at two. We're gonna move on to your bill, which is Senate Bill 156. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Senate Bill 156 is a small bill, just over two pages. It seeks to provide provide assistance to the hardworking employees of the Department of Labor. The bill would create a chief labor officer, that person who would have the same powers as the commissioner and would also be specifically charged with providing timely reports relating to unemployment claims and developing a strategy to improve the reliability and the timeless, uh, t uh, t timeliness of services to our citizens. The officer would be appointed by the governor and confirmed by the Senate Oversight Committee. The office would expire on January 20, uh, 2023 there is an amendment that I have that I would like to uh, the date when we did this we missed a date but there's an amendment that I have here uh, that may not be in our packs I did not see it but it's just simply changing the date to uh, January the 23rd um, the goal here is simple the commissioner has testified there are over 300,000 claims of some sort awaiting decisions and adjudication we also heard from our state auditor that due to federal funds coming into the Department of Labor, we are going to have to be really specific in certain audit documents this year. Much of that money has come from the federal government and they are wanting accountability on it. We just want to make sure that the hardworking employees of the Department of Labor have the support and the management they need to accomplish these tasks. So it's a fairly simple, the, the um, bill from that standpoint, but it does provide additional help and care to the Department of Labor to process the multitudes of claims they've had. Thank you, Senator Harbin. Uh, that was a good overview. I appreciate your, your brevity, uh, but you got, the, got your points made. And we did receive uh, a copy of the amendment that uh, Alexis passing out and uh, committee sub. Okay, that, good. That, uh, good. Didn't know if I got your Chairman Tillery help help get with that through. Okay, so, good. Just, but I didn't want to pass that out until you had told people what you were wanting to accomplish. So, thank you, sir. Uh, so that the the amendment is mainly just so you can see what it is, but the, it's been incorporated in the new substitute okay. that, that we're passing out. And so that will be the actual uh, bill that we will be moving today if it's the committee's will is the new substitute so we need to read that into the record if you don't mind and we don't have anybody testifying so we'll, we'll be glad to open up the for okay. questions but that committee sub let's read that number to everybody okay. L you can go ahead got it LC four three one nine four nine S okay so everybody's got copy of that right but again it's only a date change so it's yep. not date not change substitute yep. okay Chairman, I'm confused. Uh, so we've got an amendment but we've also got a sub that does the same thing as the amendment yeah so we don't have to vote on the amendment we're oh, just no. going to take up the substitute uh, again I wanted to make it clear I didn't want to take over 
Senator Harbin's job here today. But I was trying to help. You are the chairman helping. <laughs> All right. So anybody have any questions about process first? So we're, we're everybody's okay on what we're working on. Okay. Senator Merritt, you're at number 10. You're recognized. Oh, can you hear me? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And good morning, everybody. Um, normally, I'm a little concerned about any areas where we may overreach. <laughs> But in this case, given the amount of um, backlog um, unemployment benefits that we've seen and the multitude of people that are having, a, you know, a, just haven't even gotten their benefits even back from March, I'm, I, I would make the, the, the exception here um, only because the Department of Labor Commissioner has failed to fulfill his duties efficiently in my opinion, and, we, and we've all seen that. Um, my question, though, is would the um, chief labor officer, is this also with additional hiring to make sure, I feel like there's been a problem with the hiring portion of it. They don't have enough people is what I'm hearing. To me, we could have rectified that back in March and maybe got some temporary workers or somebody in there. So would this uh, labor officer be in charge of that as well? He, he would have e equal power, if you read the bill, to, okay. with the labor commissioner. So it really, I believe, gives additional accountability from that standpoint uh, th that we have. And I think that's a step that we take as the legislative branch. We're taking over an executive issue that we're seeing here that needs help. And when you see 300,000 claims, and I don't know about you, but our calls and our phones mm -hmm. are lit up as far as that right. portion with response. So that's really the reason we want to try to help them if we can. Exactly. And one more question. Can we extend that date if need be past the 23rd? It could be. Okay. Um, um, it gives us a date that uh, let's see if we can get it fixed and, and do we need that person. Uh, we don't need more, more more people necessarily, and I think part of this is the pandemic is a, is a period of time that I'm hoping we're going to grow out of, Right. Uh, and that's really the reason for a date limitation as far as that. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Right. Anybody else with any questions? Uh, Senator Robertson's at three. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I have a, a tremendous amount of respect for the, for the senator. My concern is and uh, in, in the in the senator and her comments brought it to the forefront. If if we do this to a statewide elected position, you know where do we stop? Uh, all of us are sworn to uphold a, a, a certain amount of um, responsibility in whatever office we run for. Uh, if somebody is running for uh, Secretary of Labor, if somebody is running for Secretary of State or whatever, there are certain responsibilities that come with that. Um, and as I read this and as, as I understand the message that's being sent, I have as many people within my district as, as anyone else who has had these problems and I've attempted to address these problems uh, with the uh, Georgia Department of Labor. Uh, I have been satisfied on rare occasion and dissatisfied many times, but I am concerned. Uh, I think overreach is, is, is the correct phrase. And um, I think the statement was made, in this case, it's okay. Um, my profession is, is black and white. It's law. It's uh, Title 16, Title 40. There's not much room for gray area there. And so as I read through it this morning, and as um, I think there is a third rail, and I think there is the potential of us getting extremely close to that third rail when we want to bring somebody in who has the same power as a statewide elected official. And then when we look at budgetary processes and other things, do we hand that individual a budget? Do we give them the ability to spend money or we or do we have one checkbook and we have two individuals with pens who aren't speaking to each other uh, but who are uh, possibly working against each other there are just some grave concerns about this uh, this morning and uh, I'm I would be concerned uh, moving this beyond uh, a hearing this morning uh, right now but I'm one one person on this committee and and just want to make sure you uh, 
find friends and fellow senators understand my, my feelings on this. Thank you. All right, let's see. Senator Sims, is it 13 recognized? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Those of us that are legislators and we're here to represent the people of this state, um, they may have elected a constitutional officer, but perhaps it was not the right one because these are unprecedented times where people are suffering um, extreme situations families are going without because um, they did not have the revenue or the resources from the Department of Labor from the very beginning to um, take care of their basic needs. We're not talking about going to buy a car or buy a house, just basic needs. And even when the commissioner was prompted by many of us to do the right thing, he did not do that. Um, so I'm not here to please any constitutional officer or to make it uh, not uncomfortable for that person. We want to put somebody there that is going to take care of the needs of Georgians because they come first. And here again, these are unprecedented times. We probably won't ever have to do this for the next 100 years. but there is a need he was prompted to do his job he did not so we're not um, we just need to move the legislation thank you chairman walker i see you have that look yes sir <laughs> uh thank you mr chairman not, I don't really have a question for the author either. I just want to make a comment. Well, um, this is appropriate time you know, for everybody I, to make a comment. We're a small group, so I it's think fine. Senator Sims uh, made a really, uh, you know, uh, good point. But also, I do share uh, the concerns of the senator from the 29th. Um, I want it to sort of be on record, uh, and for anybody that might be watching this as it's live streamed or in the halls. The Senate has reached out to the Labor Commissioner multiple times with offers of additional resources. We've even offered to, uh, in the interim, share some of our staff. Uh, there's been offers of, uh, uh, you know, is it a budget issue? And, and it's certainly, I don't, the CARES money that he's received uh, has been a, you know, a huge amount of money. And, and frankly, he's just spurned any offer we've had to try to uh, collaborate with him and provide additional support to get, uh, get some of this backlog resolved. And um, that's the only reason I'm going to support uh, this, this measure this morning. Is I don't, the commissioner should not feel blindsided by this. Um, We've, we've extended offers of help multiple times over the past really uh, nine months. Well, the, the one other comment I'll make is this bill wasn't dropped yesterday. Uh, it's been out there for, what, a couple of weeks? weeks. And the other, thing, the other thing, we had a great uh, nonpartisan, well, we had 36 senators sign off on it from both parties just with the issues that are there. And I agree uh, with Senator Robertson. You don't like to cross those lines, but this is one. And I believe these are exceptional times when we're dealing with the issues that we're dealing with. And it's not only getting benefits to our people, but making sure that we comply with those things from an audit standpoint that need to be done as well. Yeah. And from the chair standpoint, this is one of those times. This is the committee's decision. I'm not pushing either side. I, I understand the gravity of the situation and, and uh, understand exactly what uh, Chairman Robertson's uh, concerns are, but I think every one of us feel like this is not something we take lightly. So, uh, Chairman Watson, do you have a comment? <laughs> the look of the expression even behind the I've been the mask. evaluating body language for the last 40 years it in my has. profession. So. It hadn't gone wasted, has it? That's great. Uh, thank you. I, I, I too, uh, have comments. Um, 
you know, this is a long process. I think this is something that uh, I, I agree with the overreached thought process. I see the other side of the pandemic. Uh, I think this should be a conversation that we have. And uh, I think that uh, because of what we do here in the uh, in, in your insurance committee, and uh, I think it should have further discussion. So uh, we'll have further discussion, I think, with today's vote. Uh, it still has to go to rules, still has to go to the Senate floor, and then it has to cross over or make it a crossover if it does. So I think we have a long process, but I think this is something uh, I think that is important to do at this level. Uh, and that's why I'm going to vote for it. Okay. I think we've talked it to death. I'll uh, uh, <laughs> open the committee for uh, what is their pleasure. Let's see. Senator Sims wants a due pass for the substitute that was brought forward. And I don't have that again I moved it again so let's read that number out what's the substitute number LC four three one nine four nine s okay that's that's the motion is there a second second, second Senator Merritt uh, any further discussion all those in favor of the uh, motion by Senator Sims please raise your hand Four, five. Senator Robinson, is that a hand or a prayer? <laughs> okay. So you were a yay. Okay. All right. Thank you for clarifying. And just for the committees, I got uh, chastised yesterday because I let a member not vote. So uh, Senate rules say a member has to vote, and uh, I didn't catch that. So just going forward, y'all help me rem remind our, our our peers that if they're in this room, they have to way their position we we're not allowed to vote yellow it's either green or red all right thank you all for being here you have if i can make one comment yes and, sir and that was a prayer and in listening to chairman watson who is somebody that i have have gained so much respect for uh since coming in this chamber and, and being able to to observe him and watch how he does his job and that means a lot to me um but I will tell you that if this gets to the floor, I will be adamantly opposed to it because of the fact that I, if you read history, I've heard, read too many times where this will be the only time we'll do this. And the healthcare professionals in this room understand that with the declining health of this world and with the dependence that we have on immune system altering medications that the chances of a pandemic and something else coming again is much greater than in the past i do believe that and so we have to be so careful because there are processes to get rid of constitutional officers and state senators and um, we are a democracy and we are a state, a, a republic, and we cannot step away from the rules that are written. So I, I challenge every elected official inside of this building to be very, very careful when you start messing with the Constitution of the state of Georgia and the Constitution of the United States. But I think the conversation is necessary based on my, my friend, uh, Chairman Watson. But um, I caution everybody, please be careful moving forward. Thank you. I think we all understand those uh, comments and appreciate you making them. So uh, if there are any other business, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for your attention.